We are now on chapter 14 of Pride and Prejudice. During dinner, Mr. Bennett scarcely spoke at all. But when the servants were withdrawn, he thought it time to have some conversation with his guest, and therefore started a subject in which he expected him to shine, by observing that he seemed very fortunate in his patroness. Lady Catherine de Bourgh's attention to his wishes and consideration for his comfort appeared very remarkable. Mr. Bennett could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise. The subject elevated him to more than usual solemnity of manner, and with a most important aspect, he protested that he had never in his life witnessed such behavior in a person of rank such a failability and condensation as he had himself experienced from Lady Catherine. She had been graciously pleased to approve of both the discourses which she already had the honor of preaching before her. She had also asked him twice to dine at Rosings and had sent for him only the Saturday before to make up her pool of quadrille in the evening. Lady Catherine was reckoned proud by many people he knew, but he had never seen anything but a failability in her. She had always spoken to him as she would to any other gentleman, and she made not the smallest objection to his joining in the society of the neighborhood, nor to his leaving his parish occasionally for a week or two to visit his relations. She had even condescended to advise him to marry as soon as he could, provided he chose with discretion and had once paid him a visit in his humble parsonage, where she had perfectly approved of all the alterations he had been making, and had even both chafed to suggest some herself, some shelves in the closets upstairs. That is all very proper and civil, I am sure, said Mrs. Bennet, and I dare say she is a very agreeable woman. It is a pity that great ladies in general are not more like her. Does she live near you, sir? The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has only one daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and a very extensive property. Ah, cried Mrs. Bennet, shaking her head. Then she is better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? She is a most charming young lady indeed. Lady Catherine herself said that at some point, Lady Catherine said herself that in some point of true beauty, Miss de Bourgh is far superior to the handsomest of her sex because there is that in her features which marks the young woman of distinguished birth. She is unfortunately of a sickly constitution, which has prevented her from making that progress and many accomplishments which she could not otherwise have failed of. And I am informed by the lady who superintended her education and who still resides with them. But she is perfectly amiable and often condescends to drive by my humble abode in her little phaeton and ponies. Has she been presented? I do not remember her name among the ladies at court. Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town, and by that means, as I told Lady Catherine myself one day, has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. Her ladyship seemed pleased with the idea, and you may imagine that I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. I have more than once observed to Lady Catherine that her charming daughter seemed born to be a duchess, and that the most elevated rank, instead of her giving her consequence, would be adorned by her. These are the kind of little things which please her ladyship, and it is sort of attention which I conceive myself particularly bound to pay. You judge very properly, said Mr. Bennet, and it is happy for you that you present the talent of flattery with delicacy. May I ask whether... There we go. Sorry. <laughs> May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment or are the result of a previous study? They arrive chiefly from what is passing at the time. And though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible.
Mr. Bennett's expectations were fully answered. His cousin was as absurd as he had hoped, and he listened to him with the keenest enjoyment, maintaining at the same time the most resolute composure of countenance, and, except in an occasional glance at Elizabeth, requiring no partner in his pleasure. By tea time, however, the dose had been enough, and Mr. Bennet was glad to take his guest to the drawing room, and again, when tea was over, glad to invite him to read aloud to the ladies. Mr. Collins readily assented, and a book was produced, but on beholding it, for everything announced it to be from circulating a circulating library, he started back, and, begging pardon, protested that he never read novels. Kitty stared at him, and Lydia exclaimed. Other books were produced, and after some deliberation, he chose Fordyce's Sermons. Lydia gaped as he opened the volume, and before he had, with very monentous solemnity, read three passages, she interrupted him with, Do you know, Mama, that my Uncle Phillips talks of turning away Richard, and if he does, Colonel Foster will hire him. My aunt told me herself on Saturday, I shall walk to Meryton tomorrow to hear more about it and to ask whether Mr. Denny comes back to town. Lydia was bid by her two eldest sisters to hold her tongue, but Mr. Collins, much offended, laid aside his book and said, I have often observed how little young ladies are interested by books of a serious stamp, though written solely for their benefit. It amazes me, I confess, for certainly there can be nothing so advantageous to them as instruction, but I will no longer importune my young cousin. Then turning to Mr. Bennet, he offered himself as his antagonist at backgammon. Mr. Bennet accepted the challenge, and observing that he acted very wisely in leaving the girls to their own trifling amusements. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters apologized most civilly for Lydia's interruption, and promised that it should not occur again if he would resume his book. But Mr. Collins, after assuring them that he bore his young cousin no ill will, and should never resent her behavior as any affront, seated himself at another table with Mr. Bennet and prepared for backgammon. Chapter 15 Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society, the greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of an illiterate and miserly father and though he belonged to one of the universities, he had merely kept the necessary terms, without forming at any useful acquaintance. The subjection in which her, his father had brought him up had given him originally great humility of manner, but it was now a good deal counteracted by the self-conceit of a weak head, living in retirement, and the consequential feelings of early and unexpected prosperity. A fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, and while the living and when the living of Hunsford was vacant, and the respect which he felt for her high rank and his variation for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his right as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequious self-importance and humility. Having now a good house and a very sufficient income, he intended to marry. And, in seeking a reconciliation with the Longburn family, he had a wife in view, as he meant to choose one of the daughters, if he found them as handsome and amiable as they were, report, as they were represented by a common report. This was his plan of amends, of atonement, for inheriting their father's estate, and he thought it an excellent one, full of eligibility and suitableness, and excessively generous and disinterested on his own part. His plan did not vary on seeing them. Miss Bennet's lovely face confirmed his views and established all his strictest notions of what was due to seniority, and for the very first and for the first evening she was his settled choice. The next morning, however, made an alteration, for in a quarter of an hour's tete a tete with Mrs. Bennet before breakfast, a conversation beginning with his parsonage house, leading naturally to the avowal of his hopes that a mistress for it might be found at Longburn, produced from her, amid very complacent smiles and general encouragement, a caution against the very Jane he had fixed on. As to her younger daughters, she could not take it upon her to say, she could not positively answer, but she did not know of any predisposition. Her eldest daughter, she must just mention, she felt it incumbent on her to hint, was likely to be very soon engaged. 
Mr. Collins only had to change from Jane to Elizabeth, and it was soon done, done while Mrs. Bennet was stirring the fire. Elizabeth, equally next to Jane in birth and beauty, succeeded her, of course. Mrs. Bennet treasured up the hint and trusted that she might soon have two daughters married, and the man whom she could not bear to speak of the day before was now high in her good graces. Lydia's intention of walking to Meryton was not forgotten. Every sister except Mary agreed to go with her, and Mr. Collins was to attend them at the request of Mr. Bennet, who was most anxious to get rid of him and have his library to himself, for thither Mr. Collins had followed him after breakfast, and there he would continue, nominally engaged with one of the largest folios in the collection, but really talking to Mr. Bennet with such little cessation of his house and garden at Hunsford. Such doings discomposed Mr. Bennet exceedingly. In his library, he had always, he had been always sure of leisure and tranquility, and though prepared, as he told Elizabeth, to meet with folly and conceit in every other room in the house, he was used to be free from them here. His civility, therefore, was most prompt in inviting Mr. Collins to join his daughters in their walk, and Mr. Collins, being in fact much better fitted for a walker than a reader, was extremely well pleased to close his large book and go. In pomptuous nothings on his side, and civil ascents on that of his cousins, their time passed till they entered Meryton. The attention of the younger ones was then no longer to be gained by him. Their eyes were immediately wandering up in the street in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet indeed, or a really new muslin in a shop window, could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance, walking with an officer on the other side of the way. The officer was the very Mr. Denny concerning whose return from London Lydia came to inquire, and he bowed as they passed. All were struck with the stranger's air and wondered who he could be, and Kitty and Lydia, determined if possible to find out, led the way across the street under pretense of wanting something in an opposite shop, and fortunately had just gained the pavement when the two gentlemen, turning back, had reached the same spot. Mr. Denny, addr Mr. Denny addressed them directly, and entreated permission to induce his friend, Mr. Wickham, who had returned with him the day before from town, and what he was happy to say had accepted a commission in their corpse. This was exactly as it should be, for the young man wanted only regimentals to make him completely charming. His appearance was greatly in his favor. He had all the best parts of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and a very pleasing address. The introduction was followed upon his side by a happy readiness of conversation a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party were still standing and talking together very agreeably when the sound of horses drew their notice, and Darcy and Bingley were seen riding down the street. On distinguishing the ladies of the group, the two gentlemen came directly towards them and began the usual civilities. Bingley was the principal spokesman, and Miss Bennet the principal object. He was then, he said, on his way to Longburn on purpose to inquire after her, Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth, when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger, and Elizabeth happened to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other, was all astonishment at the effect of the meeting. Both changed color, one looked white, the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat, a salutation with Mr. Darcy just designed to return. What could be the meaning of it? It was impossible to imagine. It was impossible not to long to know. In another minute, Mr. Bingley, but without seeming to have noticed what passed, took leave and rode on with his friend. Mr. Denny and Mr. Wickham walked with the young ladies to the door of Mr. Phillips' house and then made their bows, in spite of Miss Lydia's pressing entreaties that they would come in, and even in spite of Mrs. Phillips throwing up the parlor window and loudly seconding the invitation. Mrs. Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest, from their recent absence, were particularly welcome, and she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home, which, as their own carriage had not fetched them, she should have known nothing about, if she had not happened to see Mr. Jones's shop-boy in the street, who had told her that they were not to send any more draughts to Netherfield, because the Miss Bennets were to come away, when her civility was claimed towards Mr. Collins by Jane's introduction of him. She received him with her very best politeness, which she returned 
with as much more, apologizing for his intrusion without any previous acquaintance with her, which he could not help, which he could not help flattering himself, however, might be justified by his relationship to the younger ladies who introduced him to her notice. Mrs. Phillips was quite awed by such an excess of good breeding, but her contemplation of one stranger was soon put to an end by exclamations and inquiries about the other, of whom she could tell her nieces what they already knew, that Mr. Denny had brought him from London, and that he was to have a lieutenant's commission in the shire. She had been watching him in the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street, and had Mr. Wickham appeared. And had Mr. Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would be certainly have continued the occupation, but unluckily, no one passed the windows now, except for a few of the officers, who, in comparison with the stranger, were to become stupid, disagreeable fellows. Some of them were to dine with the Phillips the next day, and their aunt promised to make her husband call on Mr. Wickham and give him an invitation also, if the family from Longbourn would come in the evening. This was agreed to, and Mrs. Phillips protested that they would have a nice, comfortable, noisy game of lottery tickets and a little bit of hot supper afterwards. The prospect of such delights was very cheering, and they parted in mutual good spirits. Mr. Collins repeated his apologies in quitting the room, and was assured with unwearying civility that they were perfectly needless. As they walked home, Elizabeth related to Jane what she had seen pass between the two gentlemen. But though Jane would have defended either or both, had they both appeared to be in the wrong, she could no more explain such behavior than her sister. Mr. Collins, on his return, highly gratified Mrs. Bennet by admiring Mrs. Phillips' manners and politeness. He protested that, except Lady Catherine and her daughter, he had never seen a more elegant woman, for she had not only received him with the utmost civility, she had even pointedly included him in her invitation for next evening, although utterly unknown to her before. Something, he supposed, might be attributed to his connection with them, yet he had never met with so much attention in the whole course of his life. Chapter 16. As no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr. Collins' scruples of leaving Mr. and Mrs. Bennet for a single evening during his visit were most steadily resisted, the coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Meryton, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing room, that Mr. Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation and was then in the house. When this information was given, and they had all taken their seats, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire. He was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment that he declared he might almost have supposed himself in the small summer breakfast parlor at Rosings, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification. But when Mrs. Phillips understood from him what Rosings was and who was its proprietor, when she had listened to the description of only one of Lady Catherine's drawing rooms and found that the chimney piece alone had cost 800 pounds, she felt all the force of the compliment and would hardly have, hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, with occasional discretions in praise of his own humble abode and the improvements he it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentlemen joined them, and he found in Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence had increased with what she had heard, and who was resolving to retail it among, to among all her neighbors as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but wish for an instrument and examine their own invitations of china on the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt that she had never, neither been seeing him before, nor thinking of him since, with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the shire were in general a very credible, gentlemanlike set, and the best of them were of the present party. But Mr. Wickham was as far beyond them as all in person, as in continence, air, and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips breathing port wine who followed them into the room. Mr. Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself, and the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its uh, being a wet night and on the possibility of a rainy season, 
made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair as Mr. Wickham and the officers, Mr. Collins seemed to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies, he certainly was nothing, but he had still intervals of a kind listener in Mrs. Phillips, and was, by her watchfulness, most abruptly supplied with coffee and a muffin. When the card tables were placed, he had an opportunity of obliging her in return by sitting down to whilst. I know a little of the game at present, said he, but I shall be glad to improve myself, for in my situation in life, Mrs. Phillips was very thankful for his competence, but could not wait for his reason. Mr. Wickham did not play at whist, and was ready to light he received at the other table between Elizabeth and he was readily received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker, but being likewise extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes to have attention for anyone in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear she could not hope to be told the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and, after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. About a month, said Elizabeth, and then, unwillingly to let the subject drop, added, he is a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand. Yes, replied Wickham. His estate there is a noble one, a clear 10,000 per annum. You could not have met with a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, for I have been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy. Elizabeth could not but look surprised. You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as you probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy? As much as I could ever wish to be, cried Elizabeth warmly. I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable. I have no right to give my opinion, said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I am not qualified to form one. I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It is impossible for me to be impartial, but I believe your opinion of him would in general astonish, and perhaps you would not express it so quite strongly anywhere else. Here you are in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighborhood, except Netherfield. He is not at all liked here in, in Hertfordshire. Everybody is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favorably spoken of by anyone. I cannot pretend to be sorry, said Wickham after a short interruption, that he or any man should not be estimated should not be estimated beyond their deserts or their deserts. But with him, I believe it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man. Wickham only shook his head. I wonder, said he at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he is likely to be in this country much longer. I do not know at all, but I heard nothing of his going away when I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans in favor of the Hertfordshire will not be affected by his being in the neighborhood. Oh, no. It is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it is always gives me pain to meet him, but I have no reason for avoiding him. But what I might proclaim before all the world, a sense of very great ill usage and most painful regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men I have ever breathed and the truest friend I ever had. I can never be given in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behavior to myself has been scandalous, 
but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgracing the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increase and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighborhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had seen, yet speaking of the latter, especially with gentle but very intelligible gallantry. It was the prospect of constant society and good society, he added, with my chief introduction to enter the Shire. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable course, and my friend, Denny, tempted me further by his account of their present quarters, and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintance Meryton had procured them. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I apologize, I think this is where I left off. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment and society. A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should, at this time, have been in possession of most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now. Indeed? Yes. The late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. He was my godfather and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply and thought he had done it. But when the living fell, it was given elsewhere. Good heavens, cried Elizabeth. But how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did you not seek legal redress? There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest to give me no hope from law. A man of honor could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it, or to treat it as merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claims to it by extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was age of hold to hold it, and that it was given to another man. And no less certain it is that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper, and I may perhaps have sometimes spoken of my opinion of him and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is that we are very different sorts of men and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other he will be, but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Elizabeth honored him for such feelings and thought him handsomer than ever as he expressed them. But what, said she after a pause, can have been his motive? What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough, determined dislike of me, a dislike of which I cannot but attribute in some measure to his jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have been more born with me better. But his, father, his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given to me. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this though I have never liked him. I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him to be despising his fellow creatures in general, but did not suspect him of descending to such malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumility as this. After a few minutes reflection, however, she continued, I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the implacability of his resentments, of his having an unforgiving temper. His disposition must be dreadful. I will not trust myself on the subject, replied Wickham. I can hardly be just to him. Elizabeth was again deep in thought, and after time exclaimed, To treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favorite of his father, she could have added, a young man too, like you, whose very countenance may vouch for your being amenable. But she contended herself with, And one, too, who had probably been his own companion from childhood, connected together, and, I think you said, in the closest manner, 
We were born in the same parish with the same park. The greatest path part of our youth was passed together, inmates of the same house, sharing the same amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession which your uncle, Mr. Phillips, appears to do so much credit to, but he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy and devoted all his time to the care of the Pemberley properly. He was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most intimate, confidential friend. Mr. Darcy often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest obligation to my father's active superintendence, and when, immediately before my father's death, Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me, I am convinced that he felt to be in much of a debt of gratitude to him as of affection to myself. How strange, cried Elizabeth, how abominable. I wonder that the very pride of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to you if from no better motive that he should have not have been too proud to be dishonest, for dishonesty I must call it. It is wonderful, replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. It has connected him to nearer with virtue than any other feelings. But we are none of us consistent, and his behavior to me, there were stronger impulses even than pride. Can such abominable pride as his have ever done him good? Yes, it has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and to relieve the poor, family pride and filial pride, for he is very proud of what his father was, have done this, not to appear to disgrace his family, to generate from the populous quantities or lose the influence of the Pemberley house is a powerful motive he has also brotherly pride, which, with some brotherly affection, makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you will hear him generally cried up as the most attentive and best of brothers. What sort of a girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy, but she is too much like her brother, very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing and extremely fond of me and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. But she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about 15 or 16, as I understand, highly accomplished. Since her father's death, her home has been London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her education. After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first and saying, I am astonished at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley. How can Mr. Bingley, who seems good humor itself, and is, I really believe, truly amiable to be in friendship with such a man. How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can be a conversable companion if he thinks it is worth his while. Among those who are at all his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him, but with the rich, he is as liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honorable, and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist of the party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered round the other table, and Mr. Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mrs. Phillips. The usual inquiries as to success were made by the latter. It had not been very great. He had lost every point. But when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged she would not make herself uneasy. I know very well, madam, he said, that when persons sit down to a card table, they must take their chance of these things, and I am happy Happily, I am not in such circumstance as to make five shillings any object. There are undoubtedly many who could not say the same, but thanks to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr. Wickham's attention was caught, and after observing Mr. Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation were very intimately acquainted with the family of de Bourgh. Lady Catherine de Bourgh, she replied, has very lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. 
You of course know that Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters. Consequently, that she is aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, in, indeed I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I had never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. Her daughter, Miss de Bourgh, will have a very large fortune and is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile as she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain, indeed, must be all her attentions. Vain and useless, her affection for his sister and her praise of himself, if you are already self-destined to another. Mr. Collins, she said she, speaks highly of both Lady Catherine and her daughter, but for some particulars that he has related of her ladyship, I, sus I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in a great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nephew, who chooses that everyone connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till Suffer put an end to the cards, and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr. Wickham's attentions. There could not be no conversation in the noise of Mrs. Phillips' super party, supper party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said was said well, and whatever he did done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could not think of nothing but Mr. Wickham and what he had told her all the way home, but there was not time for her to even mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr. Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets and of the fish she had lost and of the fish she had won, and Mr. Collins in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whilst enumerating the, all the dishes at supper and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins and had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longbourn House.